everyone to our first legislative session for this season. Of course, we have our new York here, Terry Austin and Melanie Wright, who are state representatives, and Tim Landon, our state senator. And we'd like to recognize uh, members of the uh, Madison County Chamber of Commerce, Dennis Ashley, uh, Carlene, I believe. Mm -hmm. Wester Phil Gunter. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Vanessa. Hi, everybody. Any others I need to recognize? And we have several members of the League of Women Voters here as usual. Also, we sponsor with the, with the Chamber and with the Library. So Sarah Lader, our librarian, is also back there. Thank you for the coffee. We really appreciate it. Okay, we'll start out with uh, Terry, if you're ready to give your summary so far before we get to questions. If you have questions, hold them up. I know a member of the league will come in and pick them up. Thank you so much, Velma, and thank you to everyone for coming out on a Monday night. Um, this was, Today was the inauguration of the new governor and lieutenant governor, um, attorney general, and superintendent of public instruction, and it, it was a really nice ceremony. Um, I thought it was, um, it was appropriate, it wasn't overly long or drawn out, and um, all of the previous governors were there. Um, Mitch Daniels, Evan By, am I missing somebody? Pence. Kathy, Mike Pence, thank you. <laughs> and then Kathy Davis, our former lieutenant governor. Um, bill lists are still coming out, so we don't really have um, a clear sense of all of the pieces of legislation that have been filed. There have been some that legislators have already said in advance, oh, I'm going to file this, I'm going to file that. Um, I've got, I filed one, two, three, four, five, six, um, and we'll have a seventh bill that I was asked to take um, from a colleague. And so I can tell you what those are later on, but bill lists are still coming out. And I think the first committee hearings um, are starting, Ways and Means has been eating, or eating, Ways and Means has been meeting all along. Um, but then the regular committees are going to start. Now, the Senate started a day earlier than we did, so I'll let Tim talk to you about that. But so far, I think we're off to a smooth start, and um, we'll see what the session holds. Oh, you want me to go next? Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you um, to the chamber again for being a host along with the league and also to the uh, to the library. And I want to thank everybody for being here too. It's like we've got a good crowd here for our first uh, uh, one of the uh, third sessions that we have, and I really appreciate that. Uh, as Terry mentioned, um, we're really just starting things. I know there's probably been on the Senate side. I think I saw a. Uh, I don't know, a bill list, there's been a couple hundred bills already filed. Uh, there'll be more because we have until this Thursday to continue to file bills. So uh, I will say that um, this is a budget year, so that of course is the uh, one thing that we have to accomplish by the end of the session. Everything else is optional. Um, I'm led to believe that uh, the budget uh, this year, there have been some uh, indications as to maybe where the budget is headed. I had uh, an opportunity to meet with some of the uh, incoming, or I should say now Governor Holcomb's uh, folks about what they're proposing in terms of a starting uh, budget. The way the process works is the governor proposes a budget which actually sort of is what is filed as 1001 and then the House takes it from there. And they change it around in accordance with their wishes and they send it over to the Senate and it, you know, gets changed over there as well, and then it goes back for a, you know, the conference committee to try to work things out. And hopefully by the end of the session, come uh, April, whatever it is, we'll have a, have a budget. Uh, the indications from the governor's budget is that it is, I, I would describe it as being you know, an adequate budget. Uh, I didn't really necessarily uh, see anything in there which um, was monumental in terms of changes of a, of a standard type of a budget that might be proposed. Um, I don't think it, I'm letting anything out of the, the bag by saying that. 
Uh, he's indicated as far as uh, funding for things uh, like early childhood education will be a slight increase in early childhood education. We funded, uh, I think it was uh, two years ago at the level of $10 million, $5 million for five pilots. And that's going to be doubled. But the disappointing thing about that is the proposal is not to expand uh, early childhood sites. They're still going to concentrate on five counties, the five pilot counties, and only look at expanding within those counties. And I, I think that's a disappointment from my perspective because communities like Anderson and Muncie have been working for a long time in their communities to have early childhood education. So I'm hoping that maybe that's something that can change as the process uh, goes along. Um, just let me all, allow me to mention just a couple of the priorities that our caucus has. Uh, one is something which the league has been very interested in, and that is a redistricting commission. This is to take uh, the process of drawing the legislative district lines out of the hands of the legislators themselves, and instead going to a, a citizens type of a commission to come up with those recommendations. Uh, it would have to go back to the General Assembly for final passage unless we amend our Constitution, because the Constitution does provide that the legislature will ultimately draw those lines. But there is a bill. I know that the House has a bill. Jerry Torres authored that. It came out of a two-year study commission that we had to recommend that we go to a uh, citizen's uh, type of a commission to look at... Uh, drawing those bills, to, uh, to, to draw those lines, to hopefully take some of the gerrymandering out of the process, if not all of the gerrymandering out of the process. So we'll see how that proceeds. Uh, I filed an identical bill on the Senate side, uh, but the problem has been that the Senate has been the roadblock when it comes to redistricting reform. Uh, the majority party that controls the Senate just simply hasn't seemed to be, be too interested in relinquishing that power to draw the lines themselves. But we'll see how that process goes. There's also some uh, court cases out there, a recent court case that came out of uh, Wisconsin, which is very significant in terms of redistricting and striking down uh, those type of maps which are drawn uh, overwhelmingly along the lines of a partisan or a political basis as opposed to other non-political uh, uh, considerations. So we'll see how that uh, goes as the uh, session uh, develops. Other areas that we're going to have to see uh, in terms of certainly uh, also again the budget is our resources for addressing our uh, addiction problems that we have within the state. Uh, there's going to have to be more money. There's going to have to be more resources put into addressing those issues. So we'll see how that turns out as far as recommendations within the budget. And um, of course, roads and infrastructure is a huge huge issue in this session. Uh, taxes are going to be raised. I don't think there's any doubt about that. You're going to see recommendations coming I think, from uh, the majority party that there be an increase in the gasoline tax. Uh, it may allow us to take a look at the whole issue of exactly what is uh, fairness and taxation on a state level here in Indiana. We, of course, have uh, some of the more regressive taxes in uh, the nation. We favor flat taxes whether we're talking about sales taxes or we're talking about income taxes. And of course, when you have regressive taxes, that impacts uh, lower income people more than it does uh, upper income people. So it should be an interesting um, session. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back, or I'll turn it over to Melanie for her perspectives on things. Good evening, everyone. It's so excited to be back. Um, thank you so much for coming out. It's always Great. Anytime we have an opportunity to listen to constituent concerns, it really helps us immensely speak on different topics from the podium and during committees. So thank you for doing all of that. Um, I, this year, we, I got a jump on the surveys. Now that I've got two years under my belt, I kind of know what I'm doing a little bit better. So I know um, at least uh, Chesterfield has received those. So that's terrific. So. If you are in our districts, we actually all put out surveys, so that just really helps guide us. We really do look at those. Um, we get piles of those on our desk, and um, I, my pile was even bigger last year than it was my first year, so hopefully it'll be even larger. So um, I just, that, that input is just so vital. Um, 
So one thing I, I want to know, you know, I knocked on a lot of doors uh, since I last spoke with you during the election process, and there's always a theme that emerges every time. You know, the first year I ran in 2012, it was about social issues. Last year it was a lot about education, but this year it was a lot about working families. And even though we pulled out of the recession of 2008 and our unemployment numbers have gone down drastically and we're really a leader in that perspective, the working families are just not filling it in their pockets. And that resonated with voters all over the district. I mean, that's the one thing that they were just shaking their heads. So from, from Elwood all the way over to Yorktown, um, people were seeing that as a, as a huge need. So, you know, I want to do anything that I can um, on any bill that addresses trying to help working families, those who are going to, going to work every day trying to raise a family, whatever we can do to help make their lives a little bit easier. Um, as most of you know, I'm a veteran school teacher, so I take time off to go to the session, but I have seen that, sh that, that it should show up um, at school as well. And it's really, you know, we're always kind of sending food bags home for kids, and I'm sure you've you know this in your schools now. So sometimes um, we are uh, just giving kids bags of goodies to take home over the weekends and sometimes at night. That was not the case 10 years ago. So we're really seeing um, a few food security issue with our kids, and um, we try to do that in ways that are not demeaning, but anyway, we're trying to put out a helping hand. Um, that really first started coming to my attention two years ago when I came back from session and our school nurse was, was doing this. She was just handing out bags of food. So, um, so I want to just make sure whatever we do, we can do it and be mindful of our, our young children who are our foundation. You know, so often, um, those, those little brain synapses are formed so much by age four, I think like 85%. And anything that we can do to help get them off to a better start in life, it's going to make their school and just their life in general a little bit easier. Um, I am starting a women's series. Um, this is just another outreach I'm trying to do in the district just to think outside the box. So my first one is going to be this Thursday night from 6 o'clock to 7.30, and it's at Mill Creek. Um, what I'm going to start off as a women's series because just some of the, the, the items that I'm interested in just start, have very graphic details to them. You know, I've shared with you before, I'm very interested in human trafficking and again, how we, how we treat our young people, how we need to protect our young people. And so, Judge Kim Dowling from Delaware County, it really is an expert in this, in this area. So she will be our guest speaker that night. And the reason I thought about women is, you know, we reach out to our female friends who are going through crisis a lot, and I think we need to build those, uh, those safety nets of women and have that conversation, because those conversations are very difficult. I mean, I serve on the Family, Children, and Human Affairs Committee, and I've been reassigned to that this time, and that's where those issues come through. And it is, it is absolutely heartbreaking to hear how that is a reusable commodity and how that's having, taking such a stronghold, and especially since we have I-65 that directly connects us to the southern part of the country. You know, when I was first elected, that was not even on my radar. And then people from, experts from different parts of the district just reached out, and, and I just thought, okay, this is an issue that I really need to take. Uh, take to heart, because, you know, obviously it is, uh, it comes through social media, that's how they reach out to our young people, and it's what the tricky part is, our young people know more about that than probably what we do on how to navigate around on social media and how to have hidden profiles and things that adults don't know about, but yet they, you know, they're, they're not grown enough to know the ramifications of the decisions they make. So anyway, and I, and I, I would also like to, uh, in this women's series, also do one on addiction and possibly on domestic violence, just to try to bring people together to have that conversation, because I think the more resources we have and we can reach out to each other, the better off it'll be. So I'll get off my soapbox for now, but thanks for coming out. We really appreciate it. Thanks for hosting. The money's still there, um, and there's that is one of the discussions that's a debate that will be part of the debate, whether or not um, it's a wise idea to 
increase the gas tax and index it. That was the other part of the proposal. And indexing is where it just automatically goes up every year based on, I think, the consumer price index. Um, or whether may, whether that tax cut in half, I don't know, to five cents, maybe three and a half cents. Um, there's one of the provisions in that particular legislation is also taking, um, there's a, what they say is a plan to take off the, the sales tax that we currently pay on gasoline. And I think we're one of the last eight states, I think, eight or nine states in the nation that actually charge a sales tax on gasoline on top of your 18 cent federal excise tax and your 18 cent state excise tax. And so, there's some discussion about saying, well, why do we need to have that down the road? Why don't we take that sales tax off right now and use that for roads? Now, that would be some money that comes out of the general fund, um, the state's general fund, because sales tax goes to the state's general fund, but there might be some other ways. First of all, with $2 billion in the bank, how much of that really would be a hit to the general fund, and do you do you need to make up for it? So there's there's a lot of discussion. I think there's a lot of room for discussion, and there'll be a lot of ideas that come forward about the final version. And um, it's still very very early. I've not even had a chance to read the entire proposal. We've not been given a copy of it yet. So you know, I only see what I've been able to gather from news media and others, but. Sales tax is one discussion, and the surplus, use of the surplus is another part of that. And tolling, that's the other thing, is um, right now the state can choose to toll roads uh, without any legislative approval, but they do have to get approval from the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation, and that's been some of the hang-up. However, that may change under a new administration. They may say, let them toll what they want. So people are going to have to decide what they can live with, and to me, what's fair and sound tax policy. The, the only other thing I would remind you about in regards to the, um, the uh, surplus, $2 billion surplus, is it's estimated what we need to really bring our infrastructure up is about between a, mil a billion and $1.4 billion per year. So that would be a one-time reduction you could use, but you know, once it's gone, it's gone. So um, it's not enough, basically, is what I'm trying to say there, to carry out the plan that they want. It is sort of looking at, but that's why the discussion turns to increasing gasoline taxes, increasing the excise tax you pay when you go to get your registration, uh, you know, at the BMV and all that, and this idea of tolls. So um, it, it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's, they're going to have to find a more permanent uh, uh, revenue source by which to do that. And we yeah. get about a billion dollars a year from the federal government. <laughs> About in road funding. In road yeah. funding. And that's for state. Yeah, state. They, they do give some to local, but not much. So. Right. The other thing I pointed out was that we're still rolling out tax breaks to businesses and corporations at the tune of about another $150 million, I think it is, over the next, whatever, three or four years. So I only raise that because that's not nearly enough to cover this issue too, but it is worth discussing when we are asking everybody else to uh, you know, pay more in taxes as well. So. That's not been part of the discussion. And here's just a little quick fact that you might want to know. We have approximately 12,000 miles of state highway in the state of Indiana. In fact, it's in statute. You can't have, the state cannot maintain more than 12,000 miles, which I think the first thing I'll do is get rid of that because I don't think it makes sense anymore. But 90% um, of the roadways that we do have in Indiana are at the local level, local city, town, and county level. So the, now, there is an argument to be made that it's more expensive to upkeep state highways and interstates, particularly if you have to build to federal standards and federal environmentals. But at the same time, the majority of traffic um, 
is taking place on a day-to-day -day basis down at the local level. That was the big fight, I would say fight, last year, um, is when the road funding bill first came out, there was absolutely no money for locals. And that was something that many of us felt strongly about. And in the end, we were able to bring, what, about eight, what did we end up? Was around $800 million that ended up going to locals last year? It was a significant amount of money, so. Because there's so many factors. 
factors that, that tap into that poverty and just, you know, family environment and just just so many things. I mean, I part of my teaching load is kindergarten through fifth grade, and so I see all of the students come in, and it's a remarkable difference even in kindergarten. So I think we just seriously need to look at that component because now what we're finding not only teacher shortages, but we're also finding people who are not drawn to teach, teaching special education, um, and then higher order math and um, and English language arts just because they they carry such a large burden for that. And when it comes between um, servicing your students and taking care of your family financially, now that's what we've, we've given teachers the decision to do. So um, to me, this was no surprise when it came out and it was so uh, just unequal. I just saw the writing on the wall years ago. So, it, so now hopefully we will do something to address that. Um, because it just, it just, it's, it's not fair and it's just not an adequate measure of student success. Yeah, I, I mean, to the last point I said, we're just, we, we find teachers who just don't want to go into that, but their talents might lie in, in helping students with uh, special needs or those who are struggling or those who need more remediation. How, how in the world will we be able to recruit in those areas? Because if it's tied to your performance pay, you know, there, there is a growth, uh, there's a growth portion within that percentage, but it's it's not enough to, to overcome, you know, the scores themselves, so it's just, it's just not adequate. I think that the case has been decided by the Supreme Court that, um, the voucher system, as it's called, uh, and I, I can't remember the exact rationale of the court as to why they felt that it was constitutional. But, um, but anyway, it, it, the courts have ruled that the uh, voucher assistance that um, private schools or that uh, church affiliated schools receive does not violate the First Amendment. So, uh, because I think the Believe me, well, the assistance is actually going to the parents or to the families and not to the schools themselves, I guess. I, I don't know. I'd have to review that that decision. But it doesn't uh, alter the issue of do those dollars which are being directed to the, those schools, other than public schools, does that act as a drain on the funding for public schools? And in Indiana, we have had some of the most aggressive uh, voucher growth uh, over the last uh, several years because we've authorized continually uh, uh, more and more vouchers going to private schools. So, you know, there comes a point where it certainly is fair, and I think we've asked for this, that there should be a full accounting in terms of the dollars, how much is going to vouchers, and uh, you know, what is the impact on public school funding? I, I, again, uh, it's, a, it's a budget year, so we'll see what type of funding is recommended for, for public schools K through 12. I know that the governor's um, <coughs> proposed budget that I uh, was uh, shared with again today, it had, a, I think it was like a 1% increase for, um, for K through 12, which in my opinion is not very much, but you know, again, that will be part of the budget process, but it raises this overall issue of what's adequate funding for our public schools. Uh, we've done a lot of things over the over the last uh, um, you know several sessions to really undermine, I think, the uh, funding for our, our public schools uh, to the point that we've had school systems that couldn't even afford to keep their school bus uh, school buses on the roads, and uh, that you know that's not right. We we can't have that. So. Again, it's another year to raise these issues and to hopefully uh, get them correct. We need, and this is a little bit of a side issue, but you know, one of the things which Governor Holcomb came out with, uh, with recommending last week when he <clears throat> talked about his legislative priorities is he wants to turn the office of superintendent of public instruction to, from an elected office to an uh, appointed office. So, um, you know, there again, I, I just worry a little bit about that moved because I think public education is very, very important. And I think in Indiana, we've had a long history of 
say that that's something which will let the people decide uh, who should be leading our state as far as the policies go, and that we think that's such an important um, you know, policy of the state that we should have a separately elected uh, official for that. But uh, you know, it's going to be, that's just one of the several education issues that we're going to be looking at this year. I think I would just say we're never going to be able to repeal vouchers. It's just not going to happen. But I think one of the things that's been missing from the discussion, and I think it's a legitimate issue, is the fact that we are allowing tax dollars to flow for some children. And what I mean by that is to say that private schools do not have to have an open enrollment policy like public schools and charter schools do. And as long as we allow some schools to pick their students, it seems to me unfair. Why in the world would you discriminate against a child? If we are gonna say that choice and, and parent choice is important, is it okay for some parents to have choice but not others? And so that's where I'd like to see us start to move the discussion, is how do we make sure that if we're going to have these policies where you can go wherever you want, then you truly can go wherever you want. And so I'm hoping that at some point, I'm just going to keep beating that drum, and at some point, you know, people will, it will start to resonate with people. It's not whether or not we should have vouchers. They're here to stay. But should we have vouchers for some kids and not for others? Um, should schools truly be allowed to choose? So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, one more thing. And what makes it tricky for superintendents is now that that money follows the child and there's two attendance count days, that if, let's say, a child is leaves a school corporation two days after the attendance count date, well, that money still goes to the original school, but the child goes to a different school. So you can't... You know, we have teachers that are who are in year long contracts, and yet we have students who have mobility by semester, basically. So that's that's really uh, it's it's tricky for their budget. You know, they have to make sure that they they have enough just in case, and, and you don't know until the students works arrive on the first day of school in some cases. We had three weeks of school at Daleville Community Schools between Thanksgiving and Christmas. By the end of the second week, we had picked up like 17 students K through 12. Before I left to go on leave, I had to make a stack of, of index cards of new students who we were getting and throw out some of them who were leaving. So it is, it is this, this motion that creates the instability of budgets. And, and granted, families move. I mean, we, we know that. We know that things like that happen. But I think to allow movement all during the school year, is, it's just a really sticky wicket. And I don't think it's doing what's best for kids either in their long-term educational process. It was in the mid 20s, I want to say. I don't know for sure. It said that, well, they agreed to maintain an average wage of about $30 an hour. That was, but average is management and workers. I know that there was uh, always a thought that we were going to use all of the lottery money or the you know, gambling money or whatever on, uh, on education, and that never has really been the case. That, that money has been utilized you know, over time for various things. I, I, it's sort of a situation where uh, we may have it here as to the exact divisions of it, but you know, it, 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 it's a revenue source like any other revenue source, and so you know, each budget uh, cycle it comes up and it it's, can be utilized to help fund the general fund and some other things as well, but let's see if we can get... All right, Terry's got a pie chart here. 
Okay, since, I'll just read it from their annual report. Since its inception in October 1989, the Hoosier Lottery has paid almost $11.5 billion to winning players as, and has contributed more than $5.1 billion to good causes across the state, including the local police and firefighters pensions, the <coughs> retirement fund, and the Build Indiana Fund. That was the fund that was done away with several years ago. Um, approximately 1.3 billion has been paid to lottery retailers. Um, so about 27% of, of the lottery's um, intake has been, it's, and let me just give you some more. Build Indiana Fund gets $251 million. Um, that's total. Police and firefighter pensions is $30 million. Teachers Retirement Fund is $30 million. And you can just Google HoosierLottery.com and you can find their report. And if anybody wants more, we can make a request and we'll be happy to send that to you. We actually probably get more money from the casinos. Yeah. And, you know, that just is used generally, you might say, for, uh, you know, budget or budgetary purposes, including, I think, some of the things Jerry mentioned there. has a bill. I don't know. It's, it's so early in the session that it's, it's impossible to know where bills are going to actually uh, end up, you know, at the end of the session. But uh, the one positive thing I will say about the House bill is that the House has passed a redistricting uh, commission bill before. So uh, based upon that, you would think there might uh, be a fair chance that there'll be a bill that will get out of the House. Uh, come over to the Senate. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm not overly optimistic because during the interim study committee, the two-year study committee we had on this, which included appointments from all four caucuses, um, the only caucus members of that commission who voted against the recommendations for a um, commission was the uh, Senate Republican Caucus, and they control the Senate. So, you know, it'll be up to them whether or not they're going to advance that bill, but they seem to be sort of indicating a uh, propensity not to hear that bill. So, uh, but you know, there, there, again, there's a court case out there. there. There's things happening. There may be a decision by the Supreme Court that uh, strikes down this, you know, very partisan, gerrymandering type of, of uh, redistricting that goes on. And if that happens, then they will have any choice. We're going to have to come up with some some other way to do the uh, district. So I would hope that they're feeling at least some pressure to take a look at uh, alternatives to the current system. Um, the current system is flawed. It is, uh, people do not have faith in it. They believe that it's all done on the basis of uh, drawing the lines to preserve the power of the, of the uh, incumbents and uh, the right. So, so we'll see. Um, I, I'm not hopeful that we'll actually have a bill this, this year, but I am hopeful that eventually um, the issue is going to get uh, forced in the courts, mm -hmm. over, and there will be no choice. And we paid it off early. Uh, we paid it back early, which saved employers a significant amount of penalties. That was done last, was it two years ago? Last, that was last October. Not this October, a year ago. Yeah. October, November. I, again, I don't know whether a bill's been filed or not yet. If, if anything happens, it's likely to happen in the budget bill where they can raise the amount that you can make before um, you're not eligible for the CCDF child care voucher. Um, but again, there are some groups that are gonna try to work on that, but I haven't heard any discussion about it coming, picking up any steam or, I think people are still waiting to see how the true revenue forecasts come in. You know, we've got an early forecast that said, we weren't going to get as much money. Then we ended up 
what, a couple months later, taking in a little more money or the forecast picked up. So it's kind of one of these things. And until the March, I would say until March and April, it's not sure what, I don't think anybody will be really sure what gets picked up or funded and what doesn't. I'm not seen any, I'm not aware of any bill being filed with popular vote. Again, you know, you know, we still have a few more days. I think our bill filing deadline is actually tomorrow at 2.30. 2 um, so it's hard to say. There actually was some comment made of, um, by a gentleman out of Terre Haute who wanted to basically lock in electoral college votes based on the election. Um, because right now, People are obligated, but there's no law that says they actually have to vote how how they ran for, a, and you saw that discussion play out, um, how they show, ran to serve as an elect, electoral representative, um, and he wants to make sure that people can't change their mind or change their position after the fact, but again, I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. Actually, I think your voices would carry more weight at the state house than uh, teachers and principals and superintendents. Um, so, if you, I, I mean, obviously, we're on on the same page on that because one of our tenets is to you know support public education. We just feel like that is just you know fundamental to to what we do, to what we provide to our citizens. Um, I think it'll be important to have um, send messages to the education committee in the house and the senate. You know, and it'll be interesting to see the dynamics between having a new superintendent of public instruction and and how that works out. You know, she, uh, Dr. McCormick, and I live in the same town, so I'm actually her state representative. So I, I knew her in a different capacity before she ran for office. I, you know, I do think she has a heart for children, and she brings with her the experience of being a, a not only a teacher but a principal and a superintendent. And I think that experience is going to hopefully carry and should carry a lot of clout with with our legislators because that's that's a you know in in the ditch on the ground perspective. So um, we we haven't heard a lot about how anything is going to move in that area. So it, it will be interesting to see. Um, but I think you know anytime you can weigh in with the education committee, that would be great. Letters to the editor. Um, you know, I, it's, it's just an important part that we need to, to keep in our society because we do so many good things for so many children. Yeah, I, I was going to add something too. If uh, Melanie reminded me, we were talking about the human trafficking situation. Um, and, and you talked about you know, Judge Dowling's input on that, and I know we've had meetings with Judge Dowling, and so uh, really, uh, I don't necessarily want to just focus in on Judge Dowling, but the point being that a lot of our bills actually do come from constituents. I mean, she's a constituent of both ours, and you now she works, you know, in a very a unique and uh, uh, you know direct way with those issues. And, and by the way, uh, based upon that, I uh, she recommended uh, in terms of prostitution. Uh, it, you, know, you can still be adjudicated to be a juvenile delinquent for child prostitution, but when you stop and think about it, any uh, juvenile who's involved in prostitution is probably a victim of human trafficking. And so, actually, on her behalf, I have filed a bill to uh, decriminalize that, if you will, to make that instead uh, a, a finding of a child in need of services. So these are the type of ideas that, you know, don't hesitate as constituents to, to contact your, your legislature. Uh, some of the more significant bills that I've ever been involved in, they, they going way back to the do not call list. Uh, that started because I had constituents who were, you know, kept saying, can't you do something about those phone calls? I get a dinner time. And, we, you know, we started looking into it, and yeah, we actually could do something, something about that. And then a couple of years ago, um, I had a constituent, uh, again, from the Muncie area, contacted me, who was very much interested in concussion protocols and concussion injuries and what we could do to protect our, our student athletes out there. And, I mean, that was a very, you know, 
it was a unique situation because uh, uh, there was a gentleman who had uh, in, engaged in college sports himself, and his brother was a, a professional football player who had sustained uh, concussion injuries and had a very sad uh, outcome in, in that circumstance. And so he was uh, in a position to uh, himself and his family, uh, they had the wherewithal to engage you know, the experts necessary to even come forward to offer testimony, what have you, on that. But I would, I would just say that uh, you shouldn't hesitate to contact your legislators with ideas, no matter you know, how crazy you might think they are, because there may be a lot of other people that have the exact same uh, thoughts and ideas. So. Representative Carly Maser has filed a bill to raise the age of consent from 16 to 18. And I think about how I frame this. Um, currently in Indiana, the, the statutory recognition of the ability to consent to sexual relations is at the age of 16. And given the fact that it is kind of actually has come out of human trafficking situations and others, um, or and childhood prostitution, um, she said, you know, she said, and also with some um, situations where coaches and other school personnel may have gotten inappropriately involved with their students or young people that they're responsible for, and. She, it's, it's her um, suggestion, and I think it's a good one, that you know we need to raise that age to 18. And um, I don't know whether it's gonna get hearing or not. I know it's getting a lot of attention. My guess would be um, that if it does get a hearing, it might be likely to pass. Um, there probably are some things, some nuances that you would have to work through, I mean, because you can, you have to be, I think it's at 16 for the age to marry in Indiana still. So there are some issues that you have to work around. And also if there's um, two young people, they have a, what we call a Romeo and Juliet law, where you know, if they're so six, under 18, I think, it's not a criminal charges for either one, but certainly it means we ought to be having some conversations with our young people about the circumstances they can get themselves into. And so... So, you know, I just think this is, this conversation is just so incredibly important because, like I said before, you know, it just it takes us a while to be able to form those those parts in our in our mind where we know what the ramifications of the decision are, and you know, we as a society need to be protecting our children. We need to be protecting them at all costs, and so I know what I've. Came back from session, and there was a there was a situation between a 41 year old and a 14 year old, which just was repulsive to me. And for me not to see a red flag when it happened um, was even more troubling. And um, but when I was questioned by some of my high school students, they asked if she was if she gave consent. So the whole perception that you can give consent at such a huge age difference being a minor is troubling in itself. So I think that conversation is going to be a worthy one to have. I have two questions I have to write them down. <laughs> one is, one is uh, legislation being considered that would allow municipalities like Anderson to implement a uh, low cost income tax in order to hire the road. I haven't seen that in writing yet, but I have heard some discussion of, of that being the case. That we're, um, just in general terms, that there may be ways by which um, wheel taxes and what else, what else, uh, whatever else could possibly be implemented by some some cities. It seemed like is what I read. Uh, but I have not seen any language that specifically addresses that. So there may be something there. And that was part of this. That was actually part of the discussion last year, yeah. is whether the low and middle of income tax or seed income, the statutes that sort of govern those uh, taxes needed to be modified to include infrastructure. 
But if you go and look at the statute, it says economic development. And I think there's an argument. It doesn't exclude infrastructure. I think there's an argument to be made. The question is whether they would allow them to raise the, the current statutory level so that then you could bring in. Because the wheel tax may not be appropriate for every county. It may not generate enough revenue. But at the same time, if you want to, um, if you want to be able to make significant investments or participate in some of these state-funded matching programs, you're going to need a, a guaranteed revenue source, whether you do it through bonding or whatever. My second question is, there's going to, there's going to be a bill introduced that you can carry a, a weapon in Indiana without that knife. Do you guys support that or not? There is a bill, right? Has Lucas actually introduced a bill yet? Yeah. Representative Lucas. Without a license? Yeah, or he, he wants to see. That's what I read. Without a permit. Without a permit, yeah. Well, I don't favor that. No, I, I do not. Sorry, I just don't think that's reasonable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's supposed to be, you don't have to have pay for the permit to carry, and you already did the background check when you purchased the gun, and so it's, he doesn't think that we should be taxed for a constitutional right. That was the genesis of the bill. I talked to co <laughs> It's House Bill 1159, if you want to look it up. And it repeals the law that requires a person to obtain a license to carry a handgun in Indiana, and it specifies that a person who may otherwise legally carry a handgun is not required to obtain or possess a license or permit from the state to carry a handgun in Indiana. And then it also allows a resident of Indiana who wishes to carry a firearm in another state under a reciprocity agreement entered into by Indiana and the other state to obtain an Indiana firearms reciprocity license from the superintendent of the state police. Well, that's sort of a mixed message. You got no license in one part of the building, you have to get a license in the other part. <laughs> oh, oh, just so you can travel with it. That was my understanding from this morning. I do know that there have been some proposals for this budget to increase the funding for startup companies and entrepreneur uh, investments. And um, so, I, you know, I think those are things we should take a look at. How can we incentivize, you know, startup companies and people to uh, create uh, businesses here in the state of Indiana? But again, those type of efforts are going to be competing with a lot of the other things too that I think would be funny, like early childhood education. And, and infrastructure and everything else that's out there, but I do think that is worthy of us looking at. One of the governor's proposals is um, to take what the, is the next generation trust fund, which was the $500 million from the lease of the Indiana Toll Road, if you remember that back in 2007, I think. Um, $500 million of that was put in what's called an irrevocable trust, and it was earmarked only for infrastructure projects, road projects. <laughs> they couldn't spend the principal, but they would scoop out the interest every so many years or every year and apply it to specific road projects. The governor has proposed, and there have been some discussions about using that in the mix of the road funding bill. The governor has come forward and proposed that we take that $500 million and actually make it available to entrepreneurs for startup companies. So it wouldn't even be for roads anymore. And I know that there are people who are going to go crazy over that. So quite honestly, I'm surprised there's not been an out, you know, a, a cry from the Road Builders Association. But um, I don't know whether it, I think there, it, there are some other ways we can um, fund the entrepreneur, the, what's called the entrepreneur fund um, that the state has. And one of the things we ought to take a look at is the expansion of the micro lending program and made it available through the whole state. Um, the state could help create that loan loss reserve fund and make that money available to startups. Flagship, our own flagship enterprise center is now the second largest micro lender in the entire country. The entire country. So, but and they made over nine million dollars in loans. I do know that. 
with two uh, percent uh, default rate. So those are the kinds of things that we ought to be doing, making access to capital available, and also to make sure that you have communities where young people want to live and, and where they can find the right skill levels that they need. Well, our time is up, so we want to thank our speakers for coming. What do we need next? February 13th, 8 a.m. here, right? All right. Now, I'll get started. Let's thank our speakers. Tony Cook, Representative Tony Cook, could not be here tonight. He had a group of constituents coming from another part of UA, six counties, and so we had some folks come into the state house, and he said, "Please apologize for me. I promised him I would." So he could not be here. I know he'll try to make the next one. If you fill out your survey and you want to return it to me, <laughs> six here. Yeah, same, same. Okay.